in, in this class, I want to talk about um, chirality and cholesteric liquid crystals. Uh, and this is based on um, you know, going beyond the idea that I've presented so far, where we uh, approximate liquid crystal molecules as if they were cylinders or double-headed arrows. All right, so we could say, um, so far we treat the molecules as cylinders uh, or double-headed arrows. So we um, neglect the other features of molecular structure. Um, that um, means, for example, that if the molecules, you know, the two ends are really different, um, we neglect the difference between the two ends. And that's usually a, a good uh, approximation on a statistical basis, because as I presented to you earlier, um, you know, in a nomadic phase, um, we have some molecules that are pointing in one direction and some molecules that are pointing in the other direction. And on a statistical average, that aspect of the molecular structure cancels out, right? Or similarly, if the molecules have shapes like bananas, right, then um, on a statistical average in a uniaxial nomadic phase, we have equal populations of the bananas that are pointing in any direction perpendicular to the long axis of the molecules. So that even though the molecules have this banana-like shape, on a statistical average, it cancels out, at least in many cases, to make a uniaxial pneumatic phase. Right. However, there is one aspect of molecular structure that doesn't cancel out. Okay? And that aspect is um, chirality. That is the... Um, asymmetry between uh, right and left-handed structures. That is between uh, a structure and its mirror image. So uh, this is something which um, doesn't cancel out. And so the effects of chirality just keep adding up. And um, so this actually does have uh, a big influence on the structure of liquid crystal phases. So um, to, to show you um, how chirality gets into molecular structure, um, here is an example of one typical molecule. Okay, so this is um, alanine. And here, looking at the structure, um, we can see uh, in the middle of the molecule is a carbon atom. Okay, so right there is a carbon. And a carbon atom tends to bond to four other groups. And it tends to bond in a tetrahedral fashion so that uh, you know, there's, there's one group, say, in this direction, and then three more going down. So this is like um, a pyramid, but not a pyramid with a square base, like in Egypt, but a pyramid with a triangular base. Okay, So uh, a, a tetrahedron, uh, say, between these uh, four groups. Whoops, let me draw that in another color. Um, so it makes a, a tetrahedron. Uh, between these uh, four uh, groups, uh, which are all, um, whoops, 
which are all outward from the uh, central uh, carbon. Okay, so um, if any two of the groups are the same, we get a structure which is equivalent to its mirror image. Well, first of all, you know, a very common thing would be uh, if you have, say, a methane structure, right? So if you have um, methane, then you have a carbon which is bonded to four hydrogens. They're all the same. This is a very symmetrical structure. But in particular, one of its many symmetries is that it's equivalent to its mirror image. Uh, if you make a mirror plane that includes the carbon and any two hydrogens, um, you can just uh, reflect a bit across that mirror plane and you reflect the, everything that's in the plane into itself, and then one hydrogen out of the plane gets reflected to another hydrogen out of the plane. Um, now, what if you have a, a different structure where it's a carbon bonded to different kinds of groups? Okay, so if it's a carbon bonded to a hydrogen and a methane and, I don't know, a couple more hydrogens. Um, in that case, we can still see a mirror symmetry, right? If we define a plane that includes the carbon and the methane and one of the hydrogens, okay, then reflecting uh, about uh, this plane, across this plane, um, keeps everything in the plane the same and it changes one hydrogen into another hydrogen. Okay. Um, this would work also if you had a carbon connected to three different things, right? And so if there's a carbon connected to a CH3 and a COH and two hydrogens. This still has a mirror symmetry, right? Based on having a plane that includes these um, three, the carbon and two of the different things, and reflecting in that plane. Uh, uh, reflects this hydrogen into this hydrogen, okay? But if you have a carbon which is connected to four different groups, which are all different from each other, as in this picture over here, then there is no more mirror symmetry, okay? Now, uh, in this situation, uh, if you take the mirror image, of uh, the structure over here, you get the structure over there. And there is no way that you can make any combination of translations and rotations that will transform this structure into that structure. Right? There are mirror images which are really different from each other like my two hands, right? A right hand and a left hand. There's no way I can rotate or translate a right hand to make it equivalent to a left hand. It's still gonna be a mirror image. Um, so um, that is uh, a way that chirality uh, enters into chemistry. And um, this is um, a, a subject which is studied by chemists a lot. Right? It's studied by chemists, especially for uh, applications to biochemistry, um, because uh, human beings, like any living things, um, are different from the mirror images. Right? That inside of humans, we have DNA, 
which is a helix that tends to go in one way and not the opposite way. Uh, we have proteins, which are also not equivalent to their mirror images. Uh, so the whole functioning of a biological system depends on having the correct handedness of molecules and not the mirror image. So when pharmaceutical companies produce drugs, right, it's often the case that one mirror structure of a drug uh, has beneficial effects and the opposite structure, the mirror image, um, is inert or it could even be dangerous. And so it's a, a big subject within the pharmaceutical industry to produce the, the pure uh, correct handedness of a drug rather than the, the wrong mirror image. Um, this comes into liquid crystal science also, right? So many liquid crystal molecules uh, have chiral carbons. Okay. So here is an example of um, a, a, a liquid crystal molecular structure. Um, so this is a cholesterol benzoate. And um, in reading a structure like this, you recognize that each uh, vertex here, where you see uh, uh, you know, the corners of a hexagon, uh, that's a carbon. Okay. And some of these carbons are bonded to four different things. And in this picture, uh, each of those carbons is represented by a star. Okay? So the star shows uh, a carbon that uh, you know, has, has four distinct kinds of groups attached to it, like the alanine that I showed you in the, in the previous slide. Um, so um, each of those things is, is a, a chiral carbon, or people would say a chiral center. So um, there are um, multiple ways that you can um, make this structure, um, with each of those chiral centers being in a right-handed or a left-handed uh, form. So I believe this is a subject which you may have seen um, in the course also from Professor Torsten Hegman. Is that, uh, is that correct for the material science students here? Yes? Yes, um, a lot of that. Right. So this is a subject which he, he really loves. Um, and um, it's also a subject which I really love, but maybe I love it in a slightly different way than he does. And so let me uh, tell you about my version of this structure, uh, of this subject. Okay. So um, my version is um, based on thinking about uh, you know, how the chirality changes the packing of neighboring molecules. Okay. So suppose you have two chiral molecules with a structure like this one. Okay. Now we want to know how the molecules pack together. And we could say there's still a predominant axis of the molecules. Um, so we could still represent this as if it's a, you know, a big double headed arrow, something like that. But now the neighboring double-headed arrows don't necessarily pack parallel to each other. They might pack at some skew angle with respect to each other. Right. So this is a point which you know, I can illustrate either with a cartoon or with uh, mathematics, right? So the cartoon version, whoops, where did my picture go? <laughs> I had such a nice picture somewhere. Where did it go? Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. I lost it. Oops. All right. Uh, how am I going to get this? Well, the cartoon picture. I will. Um, I will bring up 
in um, Mathematica. Ah, let's see if I can do that. Um, now, that takes too much time. I will just um, hold the picture up to the camera. So if I turn off the sharing here, and I'll just hold something up to the camera. Right. All right. Um, here's my nice cartoon. OK. And in this nice cartoon, we have molecules that are represented as if they are screws. All right, so screws are a nice example of a chiral structure, right? Screws have some kind of uh, right-handed twist, which is different from left-handed screws, right? So you know uh, you have to turn a screwdriver in one direction to make a screw go in. You turn in the opposite direction to make the screw go out. Okay? So um, this is a, a cartoon example of chiral objects. And what the cartoon is meant to illustrate is that um, if you pack the screws together in the most efficient possible way, then um, you uh, don't have the cylinders packing parallel to each other. Instead, the cylinders um, tend to pack at some slight angle with respect to each other. Um, this works when it comes to liquid crystal phases. Okay? It means that the director doesn't tend to be uniform, the same direction everywhere in space, but rather it tends to have some uh, modulation as a function of position. So um, let's see if we can represent the same kind of thing with the Frank free energy. All right, so if I go back to my iPad, and then uh, let's see, share that again. There's a comment. All right. Let's go back to the Frank free energy. And I could write it in terms of either, um, you know, the, the standard form or my own personal favorite form. Let's do it in my own personal way. Okay, so we'll say, in the Frank free energy. If we have the free energy that is um, an integral, we know we can have terms that look like something times bin squared plus something times twist squared plus something times Splay squared plus something times the uh, trace of this uh, delta uh, squared. Okay, so um, this is fine uh, in a conventional pneumatic liquid crystal. Now we can ask the question, can there also be linear terms as well as quadratic terms? So uh, this example of the free energy is all quadratic in these deviations, these, these deformations. The uh, bend, you remember, is n cross del cross n. The twist is n dot del cross n. The splay is del dot n and the delta ij is something more complicated. Okay, now, um, can there be linear terms as well as quadratic terms? Okay, well, let's uh, decide based on symmetry.
so um, let's think about bend first, for example. Okay, can there be a term in the Frank free energy which is linear in bend? Um, and the, the answer is, uh, no, that doesn't work, okay? It doesn't work because the Frank free energy has to be a scalar. In fact, it has to be a proper scalar. But bend is a vector, right? Um, so how are we going to make bend into a, a, a scalar, okay? Um, we could just take the absolute magnitude like that. That would make a scalar, but um, it violates the assumption of smoothness. Right? As we talked about earlier in the semester, the whole idea in this kind of um, theoretical approach is that um, our free energy has to be a smooth analytic function of all of the inputs. And this square root, uh, this, this absolute value of the bend is, is not a smooth function because it involves a, a square root, right? That you know that this thing is defined as the square root of the x component squared plus the y component squared plus the z component squared. And this is a function which has a singularity when all of those things are equal to zero. Okay, so that violates the smoothness assumption. So there's, if we don't want to violate the smoothness assumption, what can we do? Well, we could take the dot product of bend with something, but there's no other vector lying around to take the dot product of bend with, right? So we, we have to rule this out and say, no, we cannot just have a linear bend term in the free energy. Um, okay, what else could we think about? How about something linear in splay? Um, that actually seems like it might be possible because display is a scalar. That's okay. But the trouble is here that this violates the symmetry between n and negative n. Right? That we are assuming in um, a nomadic phase that there is a symmetry between these two things, right? That there's an equal population of molecules that are pointing this way and molecules that are pointing that way, okay? So that N and negative N um, um, are, are equivalent descriptions of the same physical state, okay? But if we look at splay by itself, it, uh, it involves n, and if you were to switch n to negative n, it would change the sign. Okay. So we can't include that. What about, maybe you're wondering, what about absolute value of s? Could we have something like that? Well, no, for the same reason as absolute value of bend, right? That this is a function which is not uh, smooth close to s equals zero. Uh, that um, when we are uh, 
uh, s equals zero, the, the plot of the absolute value function you know, looks like this with a point down there. And that is uh, uh, something that would violate our smoothness uh, assumptions. Um, okay, so we're not going to make something with either of those things. Um, let's try what about something that's linear in this uh, delta ij tensor? Well, um, we'll have to say no because it's a tensor. And the free energy isn't a tensor, it's a scalar. And so um, we can make a quadratic thing out of delta ij by contracting it with itself. That's okay, but it's quadratic. If we want something linear in delta, well, we would have to combine it with some other tensor. But there is no other tensor lying around for us to combine it with. So again, this doesn't work. All right, so now let's get down to this other case. What about, could you make something which is linear in twist? Um, well, you remember twist is n dot del cross n, okay? So this thing is a pseudo-scalar. It's a pseudo-scalar because it involves one cross product right there, or one levi Civita symbol. Um, that is to say that if we were to make a mirror image, it changes sign, right? From positive to negative or negative to positive. If we want to make a proper scalar for the free energy, we have to multiply it by some other pseudo scalar. Can we do that? Okay, so um, you could say, can we have a chiral term in the free energy so that F is an integral of the something then squared plus something twist squared plus something splay squared plus uh, something uh, times the trace of delta squared plus something times twist linear. Okay? This actually works if we can put something here, which is a pseudo scalar. So something else, which also changes sign under reflection. Right? So that will change sign under reflection and the twist pseudo scalar will change sign under reflection and then we'll get for the free energy a proper scalar which stays the same under reflection. So can we do that, right? Can we find some pseudo scalar to put there? Yes, if we have a chiral um, liquid crystal. If we have a chiral liquid crystal, then we could say um, there is some chirality parameter associated with the chiral liquid crystal. There, we could say there's a, a chirality parameter, which we could define, for example, 
as the uh, concentration of right-handed molecules minus the concentration of left-handed molecules. For sure, this has to be a pseudoscalar because if you take the mirror image, then it changes to the concentration of left-handed minus the concentration of right-handed molecules, which is just the negative. So it changes sign. Right. So, um, if the liquid crystal is made of chiral molecules, um, then this um, chirality parameter will be something non-zero. Then we could we could put that in here in this place, okay, multiplying the twist. Um, so this this works if the liquid crystal is made of chiral molecules. It doesn't work if the liquid crystal is made of a chiral molecules, right? Molecules that have no chiral center. Then there's no chirality parameter to put there. So if the liquid crystal is made of a chiral molecules, um, the chirality parameter is zero. There's nothing to multiply the twist by itself. What if the liquid crystal is made of a mixture of some right-handed molecules and some left-handed molecules. Okay. Um, well, uh, you know, if um, if it's sixty percent right-handed and forty percent left-handed. then there will be some chirality parameter, okay? It'll be reduced compared to 100, zero, but there'll still be something, right? Um, if it's 51, 49, there'll be a little bit of a chirality parameter. If it's 50, 50, then no. Okay, then this thing has no chirality. Um, and the word for a mixture like that is racemic. It is a mixture of equal proportions of right and left-handed molecules so that the chiral effects can. Okay. So let's suppose that we have um, a, a chiral liquid crystal. Okay, so um, let's suppose we have a, um, a chiral liquid crystal. Then we have our Frank free energy with um, this form that I've been writing for you. So the, um, well, I'll still just leave these things as blanks. Um, that is with something times bin squared plus something times twist squared plus something times sway squared plus something times this trace of delta squared and then plus something times twist where this is related to the chirality parameter, whatever it is for that material. Now, 
Let's take the twist squared piece and combine it with the linear piece through a process called uh, completing the square. Okay. Is that something that you remember from, from algebra classes maybe? Let's see. Okay. So let's, uh, let's complete the square. Okay. So, um, complete the square. So if we have something times twist squared plus something times twist, we could write that as um, something times twist plus something squared minus and cancel off whatever you get from here. I bet your algebra teacher didn't just write blanks, but actually had variable names in there. Well, I'm gonna do it with blanks because that way you can see the point. Okay, well, here, I'll make a variable name right there. I'll make a variable name, okay? Let's call this Q, all right? So, um, then we could say, let's call this, here I will do variable names, K2 times Chris, K22. Okay. Um, and then I'll subtract off one half K22 Q squared. Okay. So if I go backwards and um, write these things out. I could say this is uh, one half K to two twist squared and this is K to two Q. Okay. And the Q squared parts cancel here and there. Or if I wanted to uh, adapt to the newfangled notation that I'm trying to introduce to you. I could say, what if I put in a K22 minus K24? It works that way too, right? That's why I like blanks. Um, okay. The point is that now, in this form, the Frank free energy is something times spin squared plus something times twist plus Q squared plus something times splay squared plus something times the trace of delta squared. This now is different from the Frank free energy for uh, an achiral liquid crystal. It is different because of this extra Q term. That means we can now read off what is the ground state, right? What's the the lowest energy state of this material. The, the mini, minimum of the Frank free energy is now to have bend equals zero Splay equals zero, delta equals zero, but the twist not equal to zero. The twist equal to this negative Q. This negative Q is something um, now uh, proportional
to the chirality parameter. So it is uh, zero if you have an achiral material, and it's something non-zero if it's a chiral material. It could be positive with one-handedness of the material and negative with the opposite-handedness of the material. All right, so now we have these four deformation modes, right? Bend, splay, delta, and twist. And we could say the ideal structure has a zero bend, zero splay, zero delta, and a specific non-zero twist. So that's what would minimize the frank free energy. So now we can ask, um, is there any such structure? All right. Is it possible to make an N of R function with all those derivatives? Right, that these things are all oops. these things are all uh, derivatives of n, right? First derivatives of n, and so now we know what the first derivatives ought to be. Is there any structure that has um, all of those derivatives? Unfortunately, no. Um, there is no structure that has a specific non-zero twist and all these other modes that are equal to zero. Okay? So the liquid crystal can't get exactly the ideal thing. So, what can it do? Well, it has to have some compromise, okay? It has to say, well, of all the possible structures, what can it possibly do that would give the closest to this ideal thing? Um, so there are two kinds of structures that arise in this situation. One, the most common answer is a cholesteric phase. A cholesteric phase has the structure that's illustrated here. Okay? This is a structure where the director say is pointing in the x direction at z equals zero. And then it rotates in the xy plane as you go up in z. So it rotates like a big screw. So this could be written um, um, mathematically as a director n, which depends on one coordinate, for example, z. And it would be the cosine of QZ, the sine of QZ, comma, zero. So this is a structure that rotates in the XY plane as a function of Z. So we could look at this equation for n and calculate what are the derivatives of that. Right? And this is something which is worked out in the review article that I gave you to read a couple weeks ago. Right? And what I show in that uh, article is that for this um, cholesteric phase, we have bend equals zero, 
splay equals zero, twist equals negative Q. Those things are all good, but we unfortunately have this delta mode is not equal to zero. So the material has to tolerate some of this delta mode in order to get the twist that is favorable. So um, this is one possible structure which um, occurs a lot, right? There are a lot of experiments which uh, find this kind of a structure. Okay, so it's a helical structure of the liquid crystal. What else could happen? Well, there is a, a less common possibility, which is called a, a blue phase. A blue phase actually has um, a much more complicated kind of structure. Um, as illustrated in the pictures here. In this kind of structure, we have um, a, a, a twist of the director field like this. We have a lot of regions with a twist of the director field like this. Okay, so this is what we might call double twist. because the director is varying as a function of x going out like that. And it's also varying as a function of y going out like that. It's staying constant as a function of z going out like this. Okay. So this is double twist in contrast with the cholesteric, which we might call um, single twist. because the director is only varying as a function of z. Okay. So um, the double twist, this is something um, that I, I talked about when we were introducing the Frank Free Energy and it's in that review article. Right? This is a structure which can have the ideal value of the twist, and it has splay equals zero, and bend equals zero, and delta equals zero. That's all great. That's perfect. What's not to like? Okay. Well, the thing that's not to like is that you can't fill up space with just double twist. It just doesn't fit, right? It's like having a lot of jigsaw puzzle pieces of some shape that fits together, but you can't keep going. It has to just work locally, but it doesn't work globally. Okay. So what happens if you try to do it globally? In that case, um, you uh, get cylinders with the double twist, as in this picture, but then you can only go out so far. You can go out some distance where the director is tilting over by about 45 degrees, and then something else has to happen. So what happens in blue phases is you get a lattice of these cylinders. Right? And so um, it's, it's really an amazing uh, complex structure where um, you get cylinders like this one, which are oriented in the X direction and the Y direction and the Z direction. Um, and they pack together to make uh, a cubic lattice of cylinders, okay? So not a cubic lattice of atoms, like a typical crystal, but a cubic lattice of these cylinders. And here is an example. Uh, this thing is called blue phase one, uh, or BP1, which is a body-centered cubic lattice. 
that is the whole lattice of cylinders has BCC symmetry. And by comparison, here is a blue phase two, which is a simple cubic lattice instead. So these are two different packings of double twist cylinders. And then in between the double twist cylinders, what happens is you need to have um, disclination lines. Okay, and so here I'll try to draw in between. There's going to be a line that comes out like this and another line going out and it cuts between the cylinders. And here's another one. And here's another one cutting out between those. Okay. And so these are defect lines or disclination lines. And so um, in the um, blue phases, we get a, a whole network of these cylinders separated by disclination lines. So this is a different thing that a chiral liquid crystal can do instead of a cholesteric phase. So which will the, will the chiral liquid crystal do? Will it make a cholesteric phase or a blue phase? Well, that uh, of course depends on the minimization of free energy. Okay. And so you could say in a cholesteric phase, there's the ideal amount of twist. That's good. But there's also some delta. That's bad. In the blue phase, there's the ideal amount of twist. That's good. But there's also all these disclination lines. That's bad. Okay. So to get the balance between these two things, we have to ask, which is worse, having the delta mode or having disclination lines? And either is possible, just depending on different energetic parameters of the liquid crystal. But most commonly, the liquid crystal will form a cholesteric phase. And so this is the, the typical thing that happens if you have a chiral liquid crystal, whereas the blue phase is an unusual thing that can happen, but not the normal thing. Um, all right, so um, this is my sort of very quick story about um, chirality and how that leads to both cholesterol liquid crystals and also blue phases. Um, I'm sure it's uh, different from the story that you might have gotten from uh, Professor Torsten Hegman, because uh, you know, he thinks about chirality also, but in a much more molecular point of view. Um, that's all right. It's good that you get different points of view and you can try to uh, integrate them together. All right, I will stop talking for here and I'll be glad to answer any questions about this subject or anything else that's on your mind as we uh, end the semester and begin to get ready for the final exam.